Welcome to the week one go-to session. This is the first of four such sessions we're going to have this month. Thanks to those in, in attendance. Attendance is a bit spare tonight, but I have a feeling this happens, by the way. Um, it's normal for week one, but it's also especially normal for a week one after the holidays. By the way, I hope everybody had fantastic holidays. I didn't do anything, but that's great in itself, having two weeks to do absolutely nothing. Um, but yeah, we're back. We're back in stride, right? So welcome to English Composition. I look forward to working with each of you all month long. Um, and basically, this first lecture is going to be completely devoted to some sort of introductory stuff, right? Just the class, and, um, some explanations of early assignments. Actually, let me show you. OK, so here's our class. I can't, I don't have a way to show exactly what it looks like on the student's end, but you, you more or less see something like this. So you have a bunch of getting started activities, right? Um, of the people, the half dozen people who are here, are we all signed up for, well, obviously you signed up for this lecture because you're here. Um, but how about McGraw Hill and turn it in? Okay, there are a couple different things you have to sign up for. Um, real quickly, because sometimes people have questions, uh, McGraw Hill. So I know someone emailed me about like wanting a code, but we don't give out codes anymore. Um, but we do have pretty detailed instructions. Basically, you just have to watch this short video. Um, and beneath it, you have this address, which if you click on it, will take you to the registration area for this class. OK. Actually, if I just I'm, I'm logged in right now, but if I sign out and then click on this link, you should see something like this. OK. And you know you're in the right place because it will say January 2019 and my name. Okay. And then you basically follow the steps. Enter an email, it should be your full sale email address, and click begin. Okay, so easy peasy. Let me sign back into McGraw Hill because I do want to show how the McGraw Hill site works. January, that's us. Um okay, but I you can use the chat by the way. Is everybody here signed up for turn it in? Um, McGraw Hill. Anybody have problems? Jared, you're signed up. Okay, good. Uh, turn it in is pretty simple too. There are a lot more instructions than you actually need, but really you just have to scroll down to this section here. Okay, you need a class ID, and you need a like a keyword password. Right? It's called an enrollment key, like New Year. Okay, so one word, all lowercase. You just need that. This number, this password. And it should be easy peasy. Now, most of this lecture is going to be devoted to talking about what we're working toward this month. We are working toward a single essay. Yeah, believe it or not, we have four weeks, but you are going to write one paper. Uh, but we're going to do it step by step. Okay. So, but that's what we're working toward okay? a single short essay. So, we're going to talk about that. Uh, but before we do, let me talk about so, okay, you have all these getting started activities, which hopefully you've done. And then everything is neatly broken down. So here we are in week one. Okay, so you have a little overview to read and watch. Um, this guy here, the lecture archive, this is where the video of this very lecture is going to be placed. So for people who need to see things again, or for obviously the vast majority of people who aren't here tonight, um, they can watch it on their own time. Um, it also includes required reading, but as I'm gonna show in a second, you don't even need to go here to see what the required reading is because it's nicely organized for you over at McGraw Hill. But I do want to talk real quickly about these two little guys here because they basically repeat for the entire month. Um, <laughs> one is the weekly journal response. So let me go into this. Now let me explain how simple it is because again, there's a lot of language here, but I've sort of highlighted the important stuff. Um, okay. Essentially, here's the thing. The weekly journal, it should be almost an automatic aid for everybody in this class because all I want with this weekly journal is proof, evidence that you, A, you watched this lecture, and B, that you did the required textbook readings. And that's why I say I need to see strong evidence that the readings were completed and that the lecture was either attended or watched. I recommend writing two medium paragraphs, one that summarizes the reading, one that summarizes the lecture. A good rule of thumb is to mention maybe three very specific things, from, let's say the beginning, middle, and end of this lecture and the assigned readings because I do know certain tricks, like when someone only references things on page one of the reading, <laughs> but nothing else. <laughs> that makes me, I shouldn't laugh, I'm not trying to be mean. 
But it does make me a bit skeptical that maybe the person didn't get past page one because everything seems to come from only page one. Um, so yeah, it, it's sort of like, um, think of it as like an informal quiz. The weekly journals are that simple. I just want to see proof that, um, actually, let me show an example. Okay? Examples are always awesome. So let me get out of this. And let me go to, you know what? I'm going to go to last month's class. So this will take just two seconds. Oh, what happened? I thought I had, oh man. <laughs> okay. Uh, past class. Let's see. How do I get in here? Ah, uh, you can't see it, but the control panel for GoTo training is blocking <laughs> what I need to click on. Um, actually, that's not the way I wanted to go in. Oh, no. Er, okay. So. Students and actually let me go in under content. So here's week one. Here's the journal response. And let me just go into someone who got a perfect 100. Okay. So here's what this student did. Um, okay. Uh, here's the, his paragraph on the assigned reading. And here's his paragraph on the lecture. Right. So he just gives me proof that he's done both. And if you can do that as well, I'm happy to enter 100. And you get you have four of these. OK, one for each week. So every week you'll be asked to prove that you've watched the lecture and completed the readings. If you can do that, I'm more than happy just to slap 100 and move on. And since there are four of them, that adds up to 20 percent of your grade. Um, so take advantage of that. OK, a lot of the classes what I like to call guinea points, almost half the classes. Um, and when half the class is an A. You can fail the other half and still pass. I don't recommend doing that because obviously you can still you can do much better than that. Um, but yeah, the class is designed so that no single assignment is going to torpedo your chances of passing the class. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Um, and it's important just to watch these lectures anyway, uh, to attend or watch them after the fact, because students who watch lectures do just fine. Almost all of them get A's or B's in the class. Um, the Assignments are terribly difficult. I don't think this class is terribly difficult, even though it does move fast and there are assignments to complete. Um, but it becomes difficult if, for example, you don't watch lectures, because then what happens is students end up guessing. Um, later in this lecture, we're going to talk about the first major assignment, which is a brainstorming worksheet. And yes, sometimes people look at the worksheet and say, oh, it's a worksheet. Look, 10 questions. I just have to answer these 10 questions. Easy. <laughs> and then they get their grade and realize that it wasn't so. Um, don't get me wrong, it's not difficult, but attending the lectures greatly increases your chances of doing that. Okay, so I'm in McGraw Hill, and here I can show how things look like. Now, I can do something gross. I can blow my nose real quickly. So I'm actually going to mute myself for a second so people don't have to hear that. Give me just a couple seconds. And I'm back. Okay, I'm back. Um, this is what things look like, like on your end once you are registered. You can see everything's organized by week. Okay, so here are your readings week one reading, week two reading, week three reading, and so on. Um, so it says 32 pages, but I'm going to show you that they're, they're 32 quick pages. Okay, this isn't like 32 pages from a novel or something. Um, so you just click on the little menu here, click this little arrow, click begin. And what you'll see is that most of the pages aren't really like full pages, right? So here it's like three short paragraphs. Um, anything in the green box you can ignore. Here it's not really much information, but at times it will give you like thought questions or um, reflections you can do or activities you can think about. You don't have to do that. You just have to read the text. And up top here, you can click on the arrow to continue to the next page. You can see there are big pictures that take up a lot of space. Um, so yeah, usually like every page just has. And listen, I am fine with what I like to call occasional skimming. So don't skim the whole thing. That's not reading. But uh, occasional skimming or reading for gist, right? So you come away at the gist of what's being said. That's what I'm most interested in, okay? Um, so the readings aren't that long. And if you're reading for gist, it should especially not be terribly long. <clears throat> but yes, does everybody understand what the, uh, well, the gist of these weekly journals is? Just write two paragraphs, okay? One that summarizes lecture and proves to me that you watched it. 
one that summarizes the reading. We got that? Yes? And sometimes people mention, like, uh, I don't know, if I tell a corny joke during the lecture, they'll mention that. Or sometimes I'll reference, I don't know. I, I sometimes get off topic. <laughs> so I think last month I mentioned what music I was listening to. And sometimes the students have mentioned that. And it's like, okay, that's proof. Because if I mention that, like, halfway through the session, you obviously were still hanging in there and listening halfway through the session. Um, okay, so, yeah, that's that's how the readings work. That's why I said you don't even have to go into the activity on FSO platform to check what the required reading is. It's just organized here for you on the site. Now, you also have these weekly achieve modules, okay? Right? Week one, week two, week three. They disappear week four. So you actually have these for the first three weeks, not all four weeks. These are also gimme points. So they're worth 15% uh, of your total grade. So as you can see, 35% of your grade should be like a perfect 100 or close to it. You also have a 10% professionalism grade. This is at the end of the month. I'm pretty easy going in the sense that I really don't take off professionalism points unless a student does something egregious, curses me out, curses out a classmate. Um, probably the biggest deductions come, well, they're not large deductions, they're actually small, but the most frequent deductions come from uh, missed work. So a uh, student skips an activity completely and receives a zero. There's kind of a double penalty for that because it's uh, professionalism points deduction completing assignments and staying up on things. Um, so yeah, 35% should be easy. 10% for professionalism, you do all your work, cause no problems, that's another 10%. You can see 45% of the class, almost 50, is in your back pocket, you'll take it, okay? So please take it. Um, but the achieve modules are also handed through McGraw Hill, and they're also organized clearly by week, right? Weeks one through three. So if you click on this little drop down menu here, you can see, Right, so if we just click on the first one, I'm gonna answer, show and answer a few questions for you. This is an interactive module that focuses on grammar issues. So we'll wait for the page to load here. And once we're in, now this happens every month, it takes me to the help section, but you can just go up here to assignment. Right, you probably won't have to go to any of these. Um, and you can choose how you want to go about completing the assignment. You can set up a schedule if you like. Looks like I already started this one last month, but I'll go back into it. Uh, we'll start talking. Okay, you can click OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Be quiet. Okay, so you can choose, like you can choose to answer four questions in a row correctly by topic, answer 10 questions in a row, or you can just dive right in and complete the assignment. It gives you an approximation of how long it will take. And here's the thing, with each question you answer correctly, you'll see this bar at the bottom of your move. And once you get to 100, you're done. I mean, you could stop short of that, but whatever your percentage is, that's your grade. So if you complete it to 87%, your grade is an 87. Um, but there's no reason why you can't complete it to 100%. So for example, here I'll answer a few. Choose this, uh, the sentence that correctly uses an apostrophe to show possession. Because you were in poor grades during the fall semester, Carrie's registration for the spring was canceled. So this is incorrect, okay? Because there's no apostrophe. Um, actually, this might be boring for you, but I, I see this problem so often. Guess what? You're going to get a quick grammar lesson. So we have simple plural, like I own two cars. Most of you are probably rolling your eyes because you're like, I already know that. You put an S at the end, but I, you'd be surprised how many times I see this. <laughs> okay, no, I own two cars. Now, if you want to say, let's say you have one car, okay? So my car's tires need changing. Okay, one car, just one, okay? That's when we use apostrophe S. Let's say you have two cars. Both of them need their tires changed. My two cars' tires need changing. Okay. Well, obviously, it's more than one car. Okay. So singular, apostrophe S. Plural, you put the apostrophe after the S. Now, if it, there, there are exceptions include things like uh, nouns that are already plural, but technically they're singular, singular like children. Okay. If you wanted to change that to children's, it would be children's, not children's. 
A little bit confusing because children implies more than one child. So you would think maybe you do this, but the apostrophe has to be S, but no. Just if a word ends in S, like uh, a person's name, what's a person's name that ends in S? Uh, actually, it doesn't even have to end in S. Okay, let me just say it's like less, okay? You could put Les's books are on the table. Or just do that. Same thing if it doesn't end in S, like right? You say John's book is on the table. Well, actually, here, I'm, now I remember why I said, it. yeah, it, for things ending in S. Okay, this has to be a person's name. Uh, let's see. Okay, the flowers. The flowers, petals are falling. Okay, the posture goes after the S. <clears throat> it would anyway, because it's plural. But you get the gist of what I'm saying, right? Try to remember it's just, if you can real simply, car, singular. Cars, plural. Cars, singular, possessive. Okay. Cars, plural, possessive. If you can remember this kind of uh, hierarchy, car, cars, apostrophe S, S apostrophe, um, singular, plural, singular, plural, you should be in shape, being the shape. You'd be amazed how often I see this, like even on discussion boards when I'm online, how many people just, well, do things like in the module, right? They, they put apostrophe S here, but there's no reason for that because it's four grades, plural, just plural, simple plural. And here it's missing, it carries. So yeah, there's an S needed, but an apostrophe is also needed because it's possessive, carries registration. Uh, Cause you're in four grades, carries, this looks good, that looks correct. And this one is, uh, Wait, 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 wait. This one looks good too. Because you're in poor grades, you're in a fall semester. Curious registration. Oh, okay. I didn't look closely at this one. Yeah, so that one's wrong, right? Um, actually, that's a flaw. <laughs> you could do it either way. <laughs> oh, no, no. It's, uh, I'm sorry. Your name doesn't end in S. If ended, ended, a name ended in S, then yeah, that would be an option. But no, this is right. I know it. I'm confident. It shows me I got it correct. And look, it moves to 2%. Um, identify the prepositions in the following sentences. Okay, so prepositions are those little words that indicate direction, like after, above, below, under, uh, and once you identify all of them, so after is a preposition, under is a preposition. Flowed is a verb, it's an action, flowed. Floor is a noun, it's a thing. So um, I feel confident that I know it's, boom, jumps up to 4%. Okay. Use drop down box to correct me punctually any of the sentences. Martha asked me, Do you have the correct time? Well, that's a question. Oh, the question, but where does the punctuation go? Um, it's this one. Punctuation almost always, almost always goes inside the quotation marks, not outside. And because a question mark is already ending punctuation, you don't need a period after. Yeah, so I feel confident that that's correct. Yep. Okay, we're up to 6%. I'm not going to answer any more because then I'm doing it for you. <laughs> but that's the gist, okay? So if you can do that to 100%, you're in good shape. So we've covered the journal responses where you summarize the lecture and the reading. We've covered the achieve modules. So just get on board. Oh, I should say one thing. Over on McGraw-Hill, I have the achieve modules set up to be open all month. The reason I do this is, well, here's the thing. The, the dates on FSO are correct. Okay, so don't be confused by that. Uh, the reason why I open up for the entire month over on McGraw Hill is because, one, if you want to work ahead, you can. Okay, so if you want to bang out all three achieve modules over the weekend, you can do so. Um, it also, it's too difficult to explain, but it helps me keep up with your grade. Um, when I put a firm new date over on McGraw Hill, people who complete the achieve module after that date, I can't see their completion for something. Okay, so let's start talking about what we're doing this month. So I have a little presentation here. I should have said this at the beginning. Welcome to week one. <laughs> Welcome to English composition. Um, I look forward to working with all of you. Um, we do have this overview stuff, the syllabus, course resources, office hours, etc. 
Um, you just have to click on the About tab on the left side of FSO to get most of this stuff. My office hours are uh, contained in, under the activity that I think says Meet Your Instructor. There's a video and there's a listing of my office hours. The Writing Center, you should take advantage of it. It's mostly done online. If you're here in Orlando, you can have face-to-face -face sessions, but most of it is handled through go-to training, just like we're doing now. Um, you do need to set up an appointment 24 hours in advance. And the address is really easy. It's just full, I'm just typing into the chat right now, uh, writing center at fullsale.com. Yeah. Um, if you choose a Friday evening, you might even get me. I sometimes work Friday nights helping out the writing center. Why do you have to take this class? Well, you can read the quotation, the statistic here. The truth is, I don't think I have to convince people of this very much. Even the few students, and it's very few, who come in with maybe a bit of resistance, like, why do I have to take this class? I'm studying recording arts. I'm studying digital cinematography. <clears throat> why do I have to take an English class? Um, I mean, they might say that, but deep down inside, they sort of understand that communication is important. Um, I always say, show me an example of a successful person who cannot write and speak. <laughs> it's pretty rare. Um, and that includes, you know, not just CEOs or elected officials or lawyers or doctors, but entertainers of all sorts. Think of your favorite actors and singers. And, um, yeah, they're, they're pretty bright. Like they have stronger writing and speaking skills than maybe you would think. Um, so yeah, I don't really have to say much about this. I think people, here's the thing. If people do come in with reservations or even raise an eyebrow, like why don't I take this class? This is an international university. I'm here to study film, music. Uh, mobile app design, etc. Um, yeah, even those students know that writing and speaking well is is important. Like they understand that people who can do so usually have fewer issues in life, especially when it comes to like jobs and stuff. Um, but perhaps their past educational experience has been so great, so they've taken English classes in the past and they've been made to feel bad or stupid, or they had a teacher that they hated. Um, yeah, I can't fix all that. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if you had wonderful teachers in the past or or, or terrible ones. Um, but this class isn't like that, okay? For one, it moves quickly. You only have four weeks. Um, the second, I think I'm hyper aware of the fact that everybody has a different starting point, right? And by the way, uh, and I think your reading mentioned this, mentioned this perhaps, but unlike music or learning a language from scratch, there isn't like a certain age you have to start or else you're sort of screwed. No, you can begin at age 20 if you haven't given, let's say, writing um, much attention. You can make incredible strides with your writing and speaking skills uh, starting even now, okay? Um, yeah, there's only so much we can do in a month. Um, you'll have to continue this interest after, but I didn't learn how to write from studying grammar books. I learned from reading. I learned also because I sort of had a passion for writing. Like I would read stuff and think, wow, that's really cool. Um, it didn't have to be serious stuff. It didn't have to be novels, although sometimes it was like fiction. But, you know, a well-written article. It could be a sports article. It could be an interview with someone. It could be a feature story on a, a musician you admire. <clears throat> but I would come away thinking, wow, that was really, I like the way the person wrote that. And then I became obsessive because I would compare my writing against writing that I admired. Um, by the way, this is what all people do. If you're a musician, you hold up your early attempts to write music uh, compared to the musicians you admire. Um, if you're an artist, you do the same thing with artwork. Okay, it's 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 a common thing that we sort of compare ourselves and because um, we can see like this is the end result. This is what we're aiming for. This is what I hope to achieve. I want to be like this person. Um, and so I obsessively did that. Compared my work and saw why is my work falling short or why is my writing not quite. And it's been a lifelong obsession. <laughs> you never quite have it figured out completely. Um, but yeah, you can make incredible strides. Um, I can say more about that at a later time for those who are interested. But let's start talking about what you're doing this month. As I said earlier, you are going to write one single paper. So not terribly bad, right? But we're going to do it piece by piece. And what is the topic of the essay going to be? Well, as hinted at in this image here, you're going to be asked to write a short ad analysis paper. Okay, uh, two to three pages. 
five closer to three. That's it. Yes, that's short. Sometimes students think that's long, but believe me, it's, it's not terribly long. Um, so you have a set list of approved ads. And let me show real quickly where they are. So if we go to week one, it's under this guy here, the last one, okay? The actual assignment itself. And if you scroll down, you can read all this stuff on your own. But here's the official list of ads. Okay, so you have five television commercials and three print ads. Now we're going to do some practicing, okay? Because right now some people might be panicking and thinking, an ad analysis essay, what does that mean? Or I don't know what to say about an ad. I don't know how to analyze. We're going to practice a bit during this lecture, okay? Um, but before we even get into that, let me give some general tips. First of all, wait until after the lecture is over to choose one of these eight ads, okay? Um, because once the lecture is over, you should have a better sense of what you are going to be looking for in an ad, what sorts of things are going on in an ad. Uh, because what you don't want to do is just grab an ad because, ooh, I have an iPhone. I'm going to choose the Apple ad, right? Lots of people like Apple, but this ad is kind of challenging. Um, print ads, okay? So we all know what a television commercial is, right? We hopefully understand what I mean when I say a print ad. Um, here, I'll click on this one, Chico, the store, which I always mean to delete every month because it is by far the most difficult ad. <laughs> I don't know why I keep including it. I think I do because every month there's one or two students who takes the challenge and chooses a sad. But yeah, this is the toughest ad. Okay, so a print ad is obviously just a static visual. Right? There's no movement, there's no sound, there's no actors. It's, just, it's all visual. Uh, the reason why I say print ads are more challenging than commercials is because, yeah, if you choose a print ad, on some level, you have to be comfortable looking at visual elements. Um, television commercials have more things going on, right? Like I said, actors, sound, movement, sometimes even story or plot. Uh, but print ads are entirely visual. Um, so be careful. All of you here will be in good shape because you're obviously here attending the lecture, but every month there's a student who blindly <laughs> chooses the toughest ad in the bunch. And then I have to be the mean instructor later and say, because usually I have a good sense that they have been watching the lectures, why did you choose this ad? Why did you choose the most difficult ad of the bunch if you're clearly not comfortable talking about print ads, analyzing visuals? Um, right? So after the lecture is over, choose an ad based on not whether you like it or not. I don't have to like it to analyze it. But based on which ad do you see the most things going on? Can identify interesting things going on? So we're going to do some practice right now <clears throat> or in just a second <laughs> because I do have a couple other general things to say. So, yeah, this is what we're working on all month, ad analysis. I'm going to keep repeating the number three all month, okay? So I want to get that kind of uh, ironed into your, your brain cells. That's not a good expression. I couldn't think of the right word there. Imprint it onto your brain. Okay, the number three. Why the number three? Because at the end of this lecture, we're going to talk about thesis statements. You probably heard that term before, but don't worry. We'll get to that a little bit later. But yes, once you've chosen an ad after this lecture, you have to be able to identify three interesting things going on. Okay, three specific things. Now, what do I mean by three specific things? Think of it this way. These ads that you see on television or online. These are created by ad agencies. They are hired by companies, right, like McDonald's or Apple, and paid millions of dollars to come up with these ad campaigns. So no choice that they make is accidental, right? These things are meticulously planned. So when I say that you have to be able to identify three things going on in the ad, yeah, three choices that the ads creators have made. Again, no decision that they make is accidental. Right. So, for example, if an ad uses a song, why that song? That's the thing. Ad analysis seeks to answer the question why. That's something I'm going to repeat a lot throughout the month as well. Why, why, why? Why this color? Why this song? Uh, why these actors? Why this? Why that? Because answering that question why leads to analysis. OK, that's essentially what we're talking about here. Um, Hyper focusing on very specific strategies, moves that the ad makes. Okay, three specific moves that the ad makes. 
Now, I do think it's helpful to think in terms of, I'm going to skip this slide, okay, because I should have talked about it earlier. It's just, it's summarizing that every week of the class is devoted to a separate uh, part of what we call the writing process. So week one, we're here, brainstorming. Week two, we're going to be here, researching. There, yes, there will be research required for this essay. Um, and organizing. The week one assignment is a brainstorming worksheet. The week two assignment is an outline, so that's organizing. Uh, week three, you'll actually write your draft. Week four, you'll get feedback from peers and me, of course, if you all get feedback from me. Uh, but here's the thing. Okay, here's what I want to show you. Okay, so you have to identify three interesting moves that the ad makes. I think it's useful to think about these moves as falling under two general categories. The first is formal qualities. Another word for formal would be like technical qualities. So the issues like color, sound, music, camera work, right? So like the nitty gritty nuts and bolts sort of design choices or technical choices. Um, then there are the thematic qualities. Okay, so these are softer, subtler issues. Um, issues of theme, motif, character, story. I put story in quotes because it's about to have like kind of like little mini stories. Um, audience, etc. So think of this as kind of like the, yeah, again, the nuts and bolts stuff, the technical stuff. This is more like the inside stuff, the interpersonal stuff, the emotional stuff. Okay. Um, so I have a sample ad for you to look at. This is on the last slide. Let me get back there. Not that one. We'll look at that one next. Here's an ad for Jeep. Okay, this is a print ad. Now, I should say, you do not see both sides at the same time. This is just revealing to you the visual trick it makes. Usually, you only see what's here on the left. As you can see, there's a giraffe's head, right? And above and below the image is the word Jeep, written up, uh, right side up and upside down. And I don't know if you can make out the lettering too clearly, but it says, see whatever you want to see. Okay. So very spare at, very minimalist, very simple in its way. But you can see the main visual trick is, is that if you look at the ad upside down, you see it's a reversible image. It's looked at one way, it's a giraffe's head. Looked at another way, it's a standard penguin. Now, even though we haven't talked about ad analysis very much, even though you might feel uncomfortable, I'm going to ask you to dive right in and just don't worry about making sense out of things yet. Don't worry about answering that question why. But already, what can we point to? Think of the last slide we looked at, formal qualities, like technical stuff, um, or thematic qualities. Like, what are things that we could immediately identify here? Like, what specific moves have the ads creators made here? You can use the chat to shout things out. Um, what are things that we could focus on to answer the question why? Why this? Why that? Or just shout out things that stand out to you. Don't worry, again, about answering that question, why it? Um, but what are some formal qualities that we notice here? Thoughts, ideas? Feel free to use the chat. People can hear me still, right? <laughs> so far, I've only heard, I think, from Jared a couple of times. Okay, Aisley says the colors are mimicking an outdoorsy feel. What? Good. But what do you mean by make sense of that to the other people who are with us? Why do you say the colors bring to mind outdoors? Because some of your class might be saying, wait a second, it's a beige background. It seems kind of fabric-y, right? It's got this kind of stitched textile quality to it. So why is that? Why do you connect that to the outdoors? I agree with you, by the way, but like, why does your mind go there? And meanwhile, what else do we notice? Color, by the way, yes. Color and background is one important aspect of this app. While I'm waiting for, uh, Na Young says it has the look of canvas prints with restricted colors. Okay, good. Again, it has this canvas. Yeah, let's. Fabric, textile, canvasy background. Uh, good, Hazley says. She was reminded of a sandy desert. Yeah, like that's an important thing. Like this ad is very, very spare, right? I mean, simple background, image in the center, and just words. Um, but 
even with this very, very minimalist ad, we can start asking questions. Why this background? Like if you're creating this ad, why in the world would you choose this background, this beige, sandy background? And it's not a solid background, right? It's got this, again, this canvas quality to it. Um, and I think Aisley and Nai Young has kind of answered that. Why? Because what does this background remind you of? It reminds you of canvas. It reminds you of burlap, right? It reminds you of, yes, sand, desert. It reminds you of even khaki clothing. And when we think of all those images, excuse me, that sort of imagery, burlap, canvas, right? It's, it's sort of like clothing, uh, tents. It's, what do you think of when you think of Jeep? Uh, yeah, Tatiana says going to the zoo. We'll, we'll mention that too in a second because that's important. Um, the Jeep, the stereotypical image of Jeep is that it's this rugged, outdoorsy, right, independent vehicle. We think of safaris. We think of off-roading. Um, even if lots of Jeep owners don't do any of that, <laughs> the most they'll haul is like groceries and children. But still, that's the classic image of the Jeep. Yes, Tatiana, adventure. Um, so can, can we already see how these are the sorts of things I want you to notice in whatever I have you choose? Like here, you would normally see this online or in a magazine and nothing twice about it. That's fine. But I would argue that subconsciously, yeah, it's understood that when you see this background, this burlap sort of canvas style background, that it connects to Jeep in a way that would not make much sense if this were a Honda ad with an animal in the center, this, this background image, right? Or uh, Mercedes, but for Jeep, it subconsciously makes sense. Um, and who was the one who said it? Uh, Tatiana, going to the zoo, right? So even just, you can even focus on things that seem kind of obvious. Like one of the obvious things here is that there's an animal <laughs> in the center, and it's privileged, right? Because it's the largest thing you see. Um, there is wording, but the tagline, see whatever you want to see, is very, very small. The Jeep is larger, so it does stand out, but the automatic thing your eye goes to is this giant image right it's it's smack dab center um and i think it's fine to focus on okay color and background could be one issue uh but the animal imagery like why this imagery and i think we've already answered that or tatiana has right it's using animal imagery because again what kind of vehicle are you going to use if you want to see giraffes in uh sub-saharan africa or go to see penguins in, in Antarctica or the southern tip of South America, right? You're not going to jump into a Honda Civic, probably. You're not going to, I mean, you could, but stereotypically, what are you going to jump into? Some sort of rugged vehicle like a Jeep. Uh, Jeeps have a strong connection to, I would say, lesser so the military, because we often see Jeeps in that kind of, kind of setting. But yeah, overwhelmingly, we connect Jeeps to adventure. So this ad is. I would say subtly, but on the other hand, not so subtly invoking all of this, right? So are we getting the gist of like the kinds of things you should notice? I mean, it's not like you have to add analysis for this class does not mean like uh, symbolic reading. <laughs> you don't have to read between the lines and say, well, giraffes, giraffes remind me of Noah's Ark. So maybe this is a biblical. No, no, no. You don't have to do any of that. <laughs> you just have to literally focus on very, very specific design choices, strategies. Okay, why this color and background? I think we have an answer. Why animal imagery? Again, we have an answer, right? This makes sense for Jeep. It would make no sense if Toyota came out with this ad. We might think it's cute, we might think it's clever, but it wouldn't make much sense because why would Toyota do that? But for Jeep, it makes complete sense. Actually, it might help. Let me show an example of what we're working with. Uh, <laughs> there we go. I have a sample essay. Um, you'll see this in week three. Nah, I don't want to say that. Um, I've done two of the assignments for this class. I've created an outline and I've completed a finished essay. I just have to find the essay. Jeep essay, there it is. I have another one that's got some nice highlights. Where is it? I got 10 million things on my lap, on my desktop here, including my photo. <laughs> oh, I can't find the other one. I guess I have to answer this one. Oh, here it is. Maybe this one. Jeep essay too. <clears throat> yeah, bingo. Okay. So 
here's a completed essay. I decided to do the actual ad analysis assignment because, well, for one, I think it's useful for instructors to do the assignments they assign. Um, for example, I thought I would just bang this out because I found this cheap ad online and said, okay, yeah, that looks cool. I'll write a paper on this. And confidently, I thought I can bang this out in an hour or two. And like 12 hours later, <laughs> I was still working on it. Now, that includes everything. Like doing research, I have six sources on the references page here. By the way, we won't, we won't talk about research until next week, but you need three sources. I have six. Um, so, yeah, research, writing, revising, putting in perfect APA formats. We're going to talk about APA formats in week three. Um, yeah, 10 to 12 hours to write a simple, short, three-page paper. So that's important, too, because it reminds me that writing is always challenging. Okay, um, I got a lot of, I think, reward out of it. Uh, but anyway, what we're aiming for is a five paragraph essay. And I'm getting a bit ahead of myself because at the end of this lecture, I want to talk about thesis statements, but I guess I'll talk about it now. Um, you've probably heard that term before. The thesis is like a roadmap to your paper, okay? It's like a single sentence, usually appears at the end of the introduction. It doesn't have to, but usually it does. And it defines the terms of your paper. So here's my thesis. Actually, it's already highlighted. And this is where I name my three, my three things. So through the use of simple color, one, playful imagery, two, and a double meaning tagline that reinforces theme, three. Okay, so that's why I said three is important. Because the three things you notice in your chosen ad, the Apple ad, the Call of Duty ad, the Allstate ad, the Chico ad, the uh, World Wildlife Club ad, the Salvation Army ad, the three things that you notice are going to be listed in your thesis statement. And they're going to become the three topics for your three body paragraphs. Okay, so five paragraphs. The introduction, which is the first paragraph of your essay. Three middle paragraphs. This is where you will discuss those three things one at a time. So the first issue is color. So here's my opening sentence for the second paragraph, entirely about color. And look, I say much of the same things that, uh, I can't remember the names. Uh, Hazley, and now Young said, right? The ad's beige background brings to mind fabric and textiles, burlap, a tawny canvas tent, canvas, right? That word came up, khaki clothing. The color might also suggest environment, dusty paths, windswept dunes, right? Sand, like uh, someone said. Even the debris kicked up by Jeep's wheels wake. The color choice is no accident, for it reinforces Jeep's outdoorsy image. And then the next paragraph goes on to my second point, which is imagery. Here I talk about the animal imagery. Explain why it's important. The animal imagery is effective because it connects strongly to Jeep's overall brand. And finally, a paragraph on the ads tagline. And I do more than just explain what the tagline means. That's not really analysis, just do little explain, like take it a bit deeper. And then there's a short conclusion. Okay, so this is what we're aiming for. So let's take a look at another ad. And again, just shout out things that you see that stand out, that are interesting. Don't worry if you don't know what to say about it. Just we have to be able to spot three things. Okay, so what are three things going on in this ad? Think again in terms of formal, technical stuff. A lot of the stuff is going to be formal or technical. In some cases, it could be. But yeah, the actual moves that the ad makes. <clears throat> Basically says city life. Okay. Yeah, I mean, they're, uh, let me extend that and say, like, uh, setting, right? So this is clearly, yeah. Like, what is it about the city setting and this specific environment that suits this ad, which is for a automobile, MG, convertible? Uh, Tatiana says 70s or 80s style. Yeah, this actually is an ad from the early 70s. I, I use it because, one, there's a lot of things going on. And second, there are retro ads that do try to recreate that kind of old time feel. So this isn't a contemporary ad that's trying to look like the 70s. This is actually a early 70s ad. Now Young says, rebelling in a bit of subtle sexual content too. Okay, good. Uh, they focus on the speed and the specs. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm not going to say that's out of bounds because it's definitely part of the ad. I, I do think there's more interesting stuff in here. I mean, here's the thing. Ad analysis is not ad description, ad summary. So, okay, they focus on the speed and the specs. My response would be, oh, so, and? 
remember, we're always trying to answer the question why. So like uh, the interesting stuff that's been mentioned so far. Okay, sexual, subtle sexual content. How is that show? And be honest, if you think it's obvious, well, state the obvious then. Or why this environment? Remember, we're trying to answer the question of why. So any thoughts? Or you can shout out other things. I'm trying to hold back because I don't want to just announce. But we have to – imagine you have to write a paper. You have to come up with a thesis that mentions three things. In my analysis of this MG car ad, these three things stand out to me. Okay, Tatiana says the lack of a bra. Yeah, absolutely. Like that's not accidental. This woman, even for these times, I think even if some of you are younger, you sort of know what the late 1960s, early 1970s means. This is, we just come out of the sort of apex of the counterculture, the hippies. We have the rise of the feminist movement. And so, yes, this is a young, independent woman, right? And, and notice the tagline, your mother wouldn't like it. What wouldn't your mother like? Well, she, if this is a traditional sort of old-fashioned mom, she would not approve of just about anything in this photo. <laughs> this woman, this environment, uh, and, and obviously the car. Okay, but that's sort of what the ad's playing about. It's clearly aimed at men, right? Men who like that suggestion, like that idea of being a bit naughty, like the idea that their mother would not approve. She wouldn't approve of this woman, this car, <laughs> this overall situation, right? This is all intentional. Right, as Hazley says, convertible is being seen is seen being for men uh, to attract women. Right. So we have like we have so many things we could talk about here, like uh, the image of the woman. Why is she portrayed this way? Like that by itself is already one of three things. And notice she's front and center, and so is the car, or the clear connection that's being made between the woman and the car. Like that could be one of your three things, right? So you do have some playroom to talk about things, but they have to be three things and they have to be specific things. And again, you're not just generally describing the ad. Sometimes students get confused, understandably, um, and get too caught up in summary or literally telling what the ad contains or literally explaining what your mother wouldn't like it means. Now, some of that might come across in your analysis, but no, your, your task is to really focus on three very specific things. And answer that question why? Why this woman? Or why this connection between the woman and the car? Good. We got other good stuff coming. Um, uh, Tatiana says the, the color. Yes, color is huge in this ad, and so is lighting. Okay. What comes to mind when we think of this, this red, this fire engine red, and the kind of warm? We got lots of orange and red here. Right. So, again, I'm going to say why we have to answer that question. Like if you're creating this app, why do that? Why not have it bright daytime and it's, a, I don't know, a white car or a blue car? <laughs> why these colors? Why this lighting? Uh, and again, if you think it's obvious, state the obvious because other people might not see it, especially people are going to be watching this the recording. They're looking for us to explain it to them. I'm going to take a sip of my drink. Well, hopefully someone answers. Uh, now Young says, suggest some downtown nightlife, fun, excitement, and passion maybe. Yeah, good. All that. Nightlife, excitement, passion. Passion, definitely. Right? Because red can be seen as a sign of danger, but it's also a passionate color. Right? And I would say the overall sense of like color and lighting is to create a sultry, right? Do we know that adjective, sultry? Kind of lurid is too strong a term maybe, but lurid, sultry, sort of, yeah. And, and, and I, I forget who said it. Was it Tatiana at the beginning? The city life? Like even the environment. This isn't like a country meadow. <laughs> this is urban. This is either evening or late at night or that sort of twilight hour okay but it's it's definitely yeah it's another thing your mother wouldn't approve of driving around this sort of car being with this sort of woman in the city at night and even notice this 
like I don't know if we have any film fans here, but the poster's cut off. Although another student pointed out, you can see it here. Uh, Last Tango in Paris. Um, if you're not familiar with that movie, it's a great movie. It was nominated for Oscars, but it is incredibly sexually frank. I mean, even by today's standards, it is intense. It was actually rated X when it came out. So it was a rare example of an X-rated film. Today it would probably be rated NC-17. Um, so a serious film with Marlon Brando, again, nominated for Oscars. But yeah, a very, very <laughs> sexual film. That's not accident. Okay. So the entire like environment. Um, so we have lots of things we can talk about. We can talk about color. We can talk about lighting, either separately or together. We can talk about the woman, uh, the link between the woman and the car. We could talk about the overall environment. We could talk about, um, yeah, overall environment or, I mean, I don't think this is maybe necessarily strong to be one of the three points, but even this guy is like staring. Was he staring at the car, the woman, both? Um, but there's a lot more going on here than you would think, right? The woman, how she's represented, the connection between the woman and the car, the use of color, the use of lighting, the overall environment. These aren't accidental. Uh, okay, yeah, now yeah, background elements. Sure, that's a good way to put it. Like a third thing could be background elements. Maybe that mentions the guy who stared. Maybe that mentions what movie is being shown. But as you can see, like none of this is accidental. The, the, the ads creators didn't realize after the fact, oh, wow, look what movie is playing. <laughs> How lucky. <laughs> it could have been a Disney movie and we would have kept it in anyway. But no, no, no. Like it's all very carefully set up. Now we have one more. Yeah, I think that's fair, Tatiana. Man, fantasy kind of vibe. It's kind of a grimy vibe. So, but yeah, I get the gist of what you're saying. It, it's definitely playing upon. Uh, men's desires, right? Um, okay, I have one more ad to look at. And this one I actually have to, because I don't, I, I need to fix this, but I believe the link is broken. Uh, I'll try it out. But... Yeah, but I'll have to type as Diet Coke, Tall, Dark, and Handsome. I'm going to put the link in your. Um, Oh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Share, right? Yeah. I'm going to put this in the chat. And if you could please go there if you can and watch it. It's only 15 seconds. And then when you get back, just start shouting out things that stand out to you. Okay, I'm going to play it one time on my end. The problem is people watching the video won't be able to hear the sound, so if they could also go to Google, I mean YouTube and just type Dyke, Hope, Tall, Dark, and Handsome. Because, yeah, it's it's not a silent ad, but here, we'll let it play. Okay, Hazel is already named one thing. She's already got one of her three things. Music. Absolutely. Sassy music, she calls it. Why this music? Again, remember, we're, we're trying to answer that question, why? Why does this ad use this sassy, I like that adjective, by the way, this funky music? Now Young mentions another important one, camera work. Boom, we got two, right? We got two awesome things there. Yes, music is super important and camera work. I'll let the ad play again because this is what she's talked about. The way the camera slowly pans up the glass. Why do that? Okay. Yeah. Now young. I, I, yeah, I do think there are some design elements simply here, like uh, the choice to use this. You often see it's like in tech products, like it gives it a very modern feel. It has this kind of brushed metal. I think, uh, can someone use that description maybe? Maybe not. But yeah, like the brushed metal, like the back of an iPhone or something, right? It has this very clean look. So it 
the word Coke, the red, bright red of Coke really stands out against it. That's definitely a design choice. Um, same thing with the tall, dark glass of Coke standing out a bit. Um, the lettering here, okay, maybe that was intentional. I mean, I'm not sure what to say beyond that, but certainly, yes, there are design choices made visually here to make Coke and the lettering stand out against this background. Or one could maybe even talk about the background, like why it goes for this very sleek look. Maybe because it's in fashion. Maybe that's the current style. And no matter if you're a tech product or a soft drink, <laughs> you want to seem very 21st century and futuristic. Uh, but how about the other stuff? Because I definitely think that music and camera work are two huge, huge things. So who wants to tackle it in terms of like, why that music? Why that can't work. And by the way, they kind of both have, I think, similar explanations. And maybe, see, I'm trying to hold back from explaining things. Like, is this, how would you do, what is this ad aiming for overall? Is it serious? Is it silly? Somewhere in between? Is it neutral? Right? And don't overthink things. Like, you all know why the music is being used. You all know what that camera work is doing when it slowly pans up the glass. Like, where have we seen this music before? Where have we seen this technique of a camera slowly panning up? Right? That's the thing I have to tell students a lot, too, which is, like, don't make this so difficult. It's not symbolic <laughs> readings. It's, it's, it's more explanations. Again, why? Why that sassy, funky music? Why that style of camera work slowly going up the glass? I don't know if people are not responding because they don't know or because they're taking, because they're still typing. To entice. Yes, but I think you're all, I mean, yes, absolutely to entice, but you're all missing something obvious and you know it. So it's not like I'm, like I hate those teachers who, you're discussing a poem, and the teacher says, well, obviously, this is a symbol for such and such. And you, who wants to explain the symbol? And you put your head down and say, please don't call me. Please don't call me. I have no idea what it's a symbol. We're not talking about that. <laughs> so, I mean, you giving off fun, cool, young vibes. Yes, def, absolutely enticed, young, cool vibe. But it's, it's, it's more specific than that. Like, where do we hear this kind of funky, sassy music? And because here's the thing if, if you were to let's say submit an assignment that explains it's enticing it's giving off a cool vibe i would say yes but that's not quite getting at it i mean i can just give you the answer but i i hate to be that instructor but i'm i'm telling you it's it's it's, it's sort of obvious the, the the ad is having fun the ad is 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 a joke it's humorous you can see it in the music, you can see it in the camera work, and you can see it in the title, Tall, Dark, and Handsome, right? Uh, tall, Dark, and Handsome is usually what we refer, or what supposedly women are used to refer to attractive men, but here it's not a man, it's a tall, dark glass of Diet Coke. And where do we see that kind of camera work? We usually see it in movies, okay? Where oddly, it's the opposite. It's women who are almost always the ones who are objectified in the film, where the camera starts at her ankle and slowly travels its way up her body right to reveal who that person is <laughs> um it's 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 such a well-known trick that it's even been parodied and made fun of i don't know if people still know these old movies like the naked gun which is a comedy it came out in the late 1980s uh but in that movie when the actress played by priscilla presley first steps on to the screen it starts yeah the camera goes to her ankle Start scanning upwards, and the joke is her legs go on for so long that you the camera keeps going up and up and up, and the legs never end, <laughs> and her kneecaps appear twice, <laughs> because it's it's such a well known joke, right? That that sort of camera here I'll show it one more time, right? This is what we see in movies, almost entirely with females with with, with female actresses. Right, as the camera slowly pans up her body, it's it's kind of like I don't know a reverse striptease or something like that. Um, but please tell me that you do understand what I'm talking about when I describe that. Right, this is sort of slow panning of a person's body, and that we've seen this dozens, perhaps hundreds of times in film intelligence. Okay, so that's the same thing here. 
and the music as well. I liked uh, Hazley's original adjective, sassy. Because, yeah, it's, again, what's the music that we associate with either sex scenes, sometimes students have said sex films. <laughs> yeah, it's a send-up of cheesy, funky. It's, it's, it, it's, a, it's a winking joke at what, quote-unquote, sexual music is supposed to be. Uh, so, and, and the same thing with the title, the ad, Tall, Dark, and Answer. And this is why I was trying to say that I didn't want to be the instructor who says there's only one answer, who can get it, who gets the you know special prize for getting it right. I, but I really do believe you all know that. Like maybe not consciously, but when you're watching it, you somehow on some level get that it's a joke. You understand that it's humorous. You understand that it's a soft drink that's being portrayed sexually. Does everybody see that? Or my, that makes sense, right? And all of you do feel that on some level? Okay, good. Because I, I think, again, I think students sometimes overthink. Like, they try to make it too difficult. I even say this about more challenging things like literature, poetry. I often tell them, Does, stop trying to think too deeply. <laughs> Just respond as, as, as you would a human being. Um, because, yeah, you all know that that's send-up music of sexiness. You all know that that camera um, and that's what Diet Coke is doing in 15 efficient minutes. So we have three things we can talk about here. Music, camera work. Um, we could talk about color, visual elements. Um, we could even talk about the title, right? Why it uses the specific language, tall, dark, and handsome. Um, to coalesce, to give one specific kind of feel, which is a humorous 15-second delivery, uh, a send-up on attractiveness and desire. But we replace Diet Coke with, a, uh, or excuse me, replace a human being with a, Tall glass of Diet Coke. Okay, I usually try to keep this to an hour, so I'm going to fly through the rest of this stuff because really we've already touched on it anyway. So I apologize if it's fast, but okay. So your your assignment is to complete this week one worksheet. I do want to show this real quickly. Uh, first of all, every single assignment comes with examples. So if you click on this, you get a previous student's attempt at this assignment. So let me go ahead and open that. And here's the worksheet, okay? So you have, oh, this is the blank worksheet. Oh, I'm sorry. This is the blank worksheet. And up here, it says click this link to see an example. Okay, so if you click on the link, you see a past student's attempt. And she's writing about the Diet Coke ad, so this will be relevant. So you'll be able to see what she's writing about. Some of the ad questions are very basic. What is the title of the ad? That's easy. For what company or organization was this ad created? What creative team worked on this ad? The second question I need research. She's only half answered it. She explained who the ad was created for. She didn't really do research into who made the ad. Um, then it asked for a kind of like a summary. Describe the ad as if you're explaining it, its visuals and details to someone who has never seen it before. But lots of students just answer this, but don't go on to this. Okay. Yes, it's an in-depth summary. But while you're doing so, be sure to identify those sorts of interesting details that we've been noticing in the sample ads we've looked at in this lecture. Okay. Um, so that's what she does here. And she does mention important things, right? Uh, the music sounds kind of jazzy and funky, like the music you might hear in a sex scene in, the, in a 1970s movie. Uh, she mentioned visuals. Okay. Uh, because here's the thing. The next question says, explain why these details matter. And if you haven't identified important details, it's sort of hard to answer question four. And here she does an efficient job. She doesn't write very much, but she does do a really good job. Everything in the ad reminds me of a sex scene in a movie. Music has a sexy vibe. The words used to describe the drink could be used to describe a good-looking man. The camera even moves up the, the glass like it might, be a, uh, might move up a person's body. The ad's message seems to be that Diet Coke is as good as a sexy romantic partner. Yeah, great, awesome. Uh, there are a few more basic questions. I'm not going to read all of them on your own. I think the trickiest ones are, okay, number eight says list three possible tactics, techniques. That's just what three things have you noticed and explain. Okay, so here she mentioned music. Uh, language. She means tall, dark, and handsome. Uh, here she says minimalist approach. Um, by the way, this is an example of not an A plus worksheet. It's a work in progress. So 
Um, yeah. So eight is basically just asking you for what are the three things that you notice. So don't get tripped up by the fancy language tactics. It's, these are what are the three moves you've noticed. In the app. So for the G1, what did I say for me? It was color, imagery, and uh, tagline. Because then prop nine says use these tactics, those three things that you've noticed, to come up with two potential thesis statements. And that's what she does here. And one of them looks terrific, this first one, right? Because she mentions three things. Sexy music, boom. Cinematography, in other words, camera work, boom. And language, to convince women to buy into the idea of drinking Diet Coke, it's as fulfilling as a heteronormative romance, which is fancy words for romance between a man and a woman. Great. The second one, not so great, because she doesn't list three things. She just summarizes the ad kind of in general. The ad uses minimalist design to focus viewers, focus viewers' attention on the product. I mean, that could be one of her th three things. I think Na Young mentioned some of these issues, color, the strategy at the end there, right? Um, the brushed metal background, the red lettering. So, yeah, you could focus on music, cinematography, and minimalist design, right? But this is not a fully realized thesis. Um, we ask for, I ask for two thesis attempts because sometimes you might notice a whole bunch of things and you're not sure what your best three are. So I can help it. I can help guide. Uh, or sometimes you might stumble like this past dude dance where you have one thesis that's terrific. And I could say, great. Yeah, go with this. This looks awesome. You got three strong points here to build your entire paper around. These are your three talking points. This one will not work because there are three talking points. So be careful. The worksheet isn't perfection. <laughs> This is a realistic example of a student's effort. It's a pretty good effort, though. Don't get me wrong. Um, the final prompt also confuses people because I don't think they read it completely, but it's, it's asking for research ideas. Okay, so she talks about uh, what she could possibly research. We, too, are going to discuss research more, but in general, research is mostly going to work to support your three thesis points. Your thesis is three discussion points, right? So in the Jeep ad, I know it's color, imagery, tag. Um, and that's what I primarily did research into. Um, so, yeah, this is where you just kind of uh, echo your thoughts about what you might research in week two. But we'll get into that next week. It's a really straightforward activity, this brainstorm worksheet. Um, I'd say, you, yeah, the students stumble with the thesis because if they watch this lecture, they tend to do awesome. If they haven't, they create things that don't even look like thesis statements. Um, and I think this is the most important prompt in the entire worksheet. Because everyone needs a working thesis before they can move forward. Again, a thesis is like, here's my Jeep essay. This is the essay that I wrote as an example for this class. I didn't complete a worksheet, but I do have some materials coming in the following weeks. Um, right? So here's, again, my thesis. That single sentence that is going to be the final sentence of my opening paragraph that defines the terms of my paper through the use of A, color, B, imagery, C, tagline. The Jeep ad appeals to blah, blah, blah. So you're going to do the same thing. If you choose a Call of Duty ad, the Call of Duty ad uses blank, blank, and blank in order to, or if you choose the Apple ad. But now you can see what I was hopefully getting at when I said choose an ad based on, choose an ad where you see lots of things going on. So the three ads we've looked at, Jeep, that convertible ad, the MG, and the Diet Coke, like which one would you, you have chosen? Maybe that second one. A lot of people had lots of things to point out about that. You want to do the same thing here. You want to choose an ad where you see lots of things going on and you can answer those why questions pretty clearly. Um, by the way, I'm not going to leave you hanging for students who really struggle and they can't see things. I still want to see you go through the effort on the worksheet. But obviously, when I respond to your worksheet, if I see that you're struggling to come up with your three points, I will make suggestions. Like I do have like lists of things that students can focus on because after all, you still have to write the paper. I'm not writing it for you. So, yeah, nobody's going to be left hanging if they can't. They, they struggle. But I do want to see you make the attempt in the worksheet. And that begins by choosing an ad where you can clearly see at least three things going on. And to repeat, print ads are more challenging than television commercials. So keep that in mind as well. Keep in mind that Chico, if you want to show off, you can try it. But this is the most difficult ad. Do I still have it open? Right. Okay. I can't even get it to appear on screen smaller version yeah it's i would hope that maybe there's one thing that's obviously going on here but yeah this is the most challenging so stay away from it <laughs> unless you really want to show off uh, 
But there are other ones. I would say McDonald's has a lot of things going on. Call of Duty has a lot of things going on. Allstate and Salvation Army are kind of in between. Apple as well. Apple's more challenging than people think. Um, but again, I'm not trying to scare you away from any particular ad. I love challenging ones. I love writing about print ads in particular because I love focusing very, very specifically on visual elements. Uh, but yeah, choose an ad where you are comfortable. You don't want to paint yourself in the corner being stuck with an ad. You have no idea what to say. about. Um, and really, the only other thing I have to cover, and I swear we'll shut things down in a second, is uh, again thesis. Right? So uh, I already talked about this. This is like well mapped to the paper. And here are two examples. So there's the Jeep ad, okay? Notice three things, color, imagery, tagline. And here's the Diet Coke one. The Diet Coke ad uses A, B, and C. And there are different ways you can phrase it. Here it's kind of like the ad uses blank, blank, and blank. In this version, it's through the use of blank, blank, and blank, the ad, blah, blah, blah. And I'll leave you with this final thing. Basically, for thesis, we're talking about a structure that more or less is kind of like this. The blank ad uses blank, blank, and blank in order to <laughs> blank. That might sound convoluted, but you, you can see how it works, right? The Jeep ad uses color, imagery, and a double meaning tagline in order to convince consumers that Jeep is their number one choice as a rugged independent vehicle or something like that. Okay. But that's the essential at its simplest. That's what we're using for you. Because those three middle blanks are going to be your talking points for your essay. And I'm going to repeat this all month. <laughs> it's going to drive you crazy, but it's because some students, they, 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 do, they do need it. Okay. Um, some students pick up on the right way and it's super simple. Others, this is the first time they're hearing these things, like how to structure a, a paper or the idea of having, Clear ideas in mind before you begin writing, or having one topic per paragraph. But we'll get into these issues next week. So if you're comfortable with what we've been, what we've been discussing, I'm not going to force you to stay here. I, in fact, I appreciate that you've shown up for this first session. Other sessions, I promise we will keep to exactly an hour. We've gone about 10 minutes over. Uh, but I will hang out and answer questions that you have. You don't have to hang around, but um, I'll be here for a little bit. Questions about this assignment, what we're doing this month, about class in general. Um, so feel free to ask away. And if not, like I said, you can go enjoy the rest of your evening and I will see you next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. Thanks people. If you have questions, let me know. Was most of that clear to people? Like a gist of ad analysis and what we're doing this month. Paisley says, I'm used to running an MLA. It will be difficult to move over to APA. Yeah, yes and no. Yes, in the sense that APA has a lot of idiosyncratic rules. Like, uh, let me see, do I still have my essay open? Yeah. So, like, look on the reference page. Like, they have this weird rule where here's the title of the article I found. In APA, you don't capitalize it like you would in MLA, where you capitalize the T, not the F and 4, because that's a tiny word, the D in designer, the M in meaning, not the O of O, because that's another tiny word, the C in color. Here, you put, you capitalize just as you would a regular sentence. So that's kind of an oddity, as you see all these lowercase titles, but that's APA. But it's not as difficult in the sense that it's doing the exact same thing as MLA, just using a different set of rules. And I came in to full sale as a person who had only used MLA. And now I know APA like the back of my hand. Also, the week three lecture is going to be entirely dedicated to APA. I can't promise it's going to be the sexiest lecture, but I will quite literally open up a blank document and show every step, like how to create this header, how to insert page notes, how to create the cover page, how to set up the paragraphing on all remaining pages, how to create insect citations, how to create references. Okay. Like I will literally do it in real time which is why i say it may not be the most exciting lecture but it might be one of the most useful if anybody's anxious about apa but yeah i won't leave anybody hanging you are welcome any other questions comments concerns
I think I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording because it looks like most people have dropped out of the room. I kept the recording because I think people probably did want to hear the answer to the APA question or comments. But I'm going to stop the recording.